All right, good morning, folks. We're going to start off the session here. Uh, my name is Chad Hamry, the moderator of the panel is called Starting a Social Enterprise. Um, now, I've called it Starting a Social Enterprise, not Starting a Social Enterprise, but Starting a Social Enterprise. So the emphasis is meant to be on the starting, uh, the process of actually taking an idea that you have, creating an organization, a company, and just going with it, balls to the wall, um, until it succeeds. So what we have, um, you've all heard of TED, there is TEDx, which are independently organized TED events. So we're going to call this TED EWB. We've got four founders of social enterprises, um, and with very little introduction, we're going to go one by one. Our first speaker is Mary Roach, founder of Le Lyon. after a few days of conflicts, I'm starting to lose it. Um, and um, unlike uh, what Chad said, I thought I was sort of with the definition of social entrepreneurship. Um, I spent the last year at Oxford, um, which is also the home of the school Center for Social Entrepreneurship, and what I found there was like a large amount of debate about what is a social enterprise. And I finally came upon a definition that I love, and I thought I would share it with you. Um, it comes from a man named Philip Santos out of INSEAD. Uh, who did his PhD, I think, out of Stanford. Um, and he um, tries to argue, or at least to, to talk about a spectrum of value, uh, from value creation to appropriation, and says that organizations, all organizations, for-profits, not-for-profits, um, you know, ex extractive industry companies, um, uh, philanthropy organizations, they all sit along the spe spectrum, and that in some way or form, all organizations have a mixture of value appropriation versus value creation. And then he introduces this idea of externalities, which um, some of you may be aware of, but the idea that um, externalities exist when economic activity creates an impact, positive or negative, that lies beyond the objective function of the agents developing the activity. So um, pollution is an externality, it's just a negative one. Um, a positive externality could be like fair trade, activities where um, the positive externality is actually the impact on the community. And so he says that SE is a domain of neglected positive externalities. Um, and what I really liked about this is that his definition takes us away from this idea of, you know, is a social enterprise a for-profit organization or a not-for-profit organization? It's just an organization that tries to internalize or to create value um, from externalities, positive externalities that have been neglected. Um, and his definition of a social entrepreneur is a pioneer. So it's the pioneer that has the guts and who is able to find a sustainable solution to um, you know, somehow incorporate these externalities. And the reality is that you know, when I read all this, I realized that a social enterprise is actually a time-bound thing. Is that once you've been able to um, find a sustainable solution and internalize this externality, you're no longer just, you're no longer a social enterprise, you're just an enterprise. Um, and you actually, as a social entrepreneur, help to make a solution mainstream. So a bit about us, um, we're Lilian. Um, I have a partner based in the UK. She's um, a Moroccan friend that I met at Oxford. Um, our main goal is to create a line of clothing uh, for women kind of in their 30s and 40s, made in Africa, um, and as much as possible, um, increasing or have as much as possible African content. Um, regard, and in terms of where we want to sell, we kind of want to just be a great brand around the world. So that also includes uh, selling and marketing within Africa. <coughs> the, um, for the definition of our, for our name, um, we really wanted to come up with a strong brand um, that both reflected um, the strength that we see in African women um, and also kind of be inspirational. Um, and then lastly, I guess we also wanted to, to play on uh, certain elements that we've been seeing in society. So um, in July, McKinsey came out with a report uh, talking about the strength of African nations and their um, growing economies. So um, how this started, um, this, this uh, company started basically for, with my love uh, for African cloth. Um, and um, anyone who's ever traveled to West Africa specifically will have probably spent a lot of time in tailor shops trying to get things made. Um, and we realized very quickly that it can be a frustrating process. So what we would see basically is that on one end you would be able to get traditional clothes, and that's what you could probably get with a local tailor in Africa. 
But then on a far end is if you were, you know, looking at the catwalks in New York City or London, you could get designer-made clothes. And there was really a lack of kind of affordable and fashion-forward clothing. And so this is where the Leon came from. Um, we did uh, some competitive landscape. Um, I guess, or I guess we, we monitored the competitive landscape, both in terms of affordability and authenticity. Um, and this is just kind of a bit of a snapshot of what we saw specifically in the market in Ghana. So where Mr. Price was starting to come in, Mr. Price is a South African retailer, uh, which is extremely cheap, but not necessarily overly African. Um, uh, Woodin, um, Woodin is a subsidiary of like the Visco um, set of companies, um, and they've started to get into clothing. While they make a lot of their uh, cloth in Africa, they make their clothing in India and China. Um, and then there were some small companies um, and small designer shops um, that were starting to emerge, and they make great clothes, but because of their, their scale, they're unable to get to affordable prices. So uh, where Leon really wanted to get to was to be able to provide um, well-designed clothes um, at affordable prices by getting to scale. Um, to give you an example of how we do this, we try to partner <coughs> with uh, local artisans and designers to kind of create co-branded products, so similar to what you'd have seen in H&M. And so this is just a page from our Christmas catalog, which is basically uh, allowing us to tell the story of our artisan and helping them to, to, to get access to a larger market. Um, by the way, these are on sale downstairs. Um, and then um, clothing is kind of our next step. So we went from accessories to clothing. Um, accessories are much easier to control, smaller product, uh, less problems. You don't have to worry about fit. Um, and um, you also don't have to worry as much as like with testing of fabrics and other things. So now we're at, at clothing, getting into clothing, and I spent the last, uh, or I spent three and a half weeks before Christmas working with designers in Ghana uh, to produce um, sample items. So this is just a, a sample of what, we're, what we have, and we're going to be taking these to buyers and basically a bunch of contacts that we have in the fashion industry to get feedback and understand or get their viewpoint in terms of what they foresee as our uh, potential um, sales channels. Um, our model, just really briefly, I'll run through this. Um, since we really want to uh, work on and emphasize um, African content, we're trying to work um, in different facets. So as I was thinking about our design, we're working with local designers. In terms of textiles, um, and I think this is, is much more of a future ambition, uh, we want to, as much as possible, ensure that the, our clothes are made with textiles from the continent, and to be honest, it's, it's quite a challenge. So other than African print, uh, the only other good sources of, of, of textiles that we've been able to find is mostly from Northern Africa in terms of like, high quality cotton and linens. Uh, production, working with small scale factories, channels, um, it's kind of still TBD. Uh, we're trying to avoid uh, the creation of a, a storefront because it involves uh, a large amount of money um, to get rent, and also it kind of locks you in to long-term um, leases. And then in terms of the customer, basically we want to ensure that whatever product we create um, is you know, really uh, reaching uh, their needs. Okay, so at the end of all of this, we've decided to be uh, a for-profit company, but to be honest, we're very far from being profitable. The reason we've decided to do this is that we want to be demand-driven. We want to ensure that the customer is the focus of our organization. Uh, we also felt that this um, type of approach would allow us to be the most innovative, allow us to reinvest profits when and if we have them, um, and allow us to grow um, with less, um, let's say, bureaucracy or other challenges. Um, the challenges so far, um, access to quality inputs that I mentioned, finishing, very challenging, qualified technical personnel. Um, so there's not a humongous garment industry in Africa. Um, and a lot of the factories that are there have actually brought in people from um, um, Southeast Asia, even in China, to come and support either in terms of pattern making, uh, production, quality control. Um, hunger for change varies, so it's, it's been hard to find partners who are willing to take the risk and who want to go on this um, kind of adventure, um, as we really don't know where it's going to go and we don't have any guarantees, right? So we, we, we have a little capital. Um, and they know that, and uh, we're very open and frank with them and saying, you know, we're looking for people who want to kind of go, go at this together. Uh, like, we want to have a fair partnership, but we also need to see um, some support and a willingness uh, on their parts to, to 
to basically take the risk. Um, and lastly, kind of trust and teamwork. Since we're trying to uh, work with different designers and small scale factories, there's always issues and concerns about IP in terms of like, is this designer going to steal my design? Is this factory then going to use the sample that, um, like the design that I gave them, and then just mass produce it and then kind of cut me out of the system? Um, so what it takes, um, I wouldn't consider myself a risk-taking person. Um, so instead of being saying risk-taking, I would rather say risk-ready. So you just need to, to know that you are going to get into a risky situation. Um, and from a financial position, it is, you know, it's very scary. So I've just finished my MBA, I have a humongous amount of debt, and I decided to do this versus take on another job. Um, and um, I'm just, you know, like I'm a planner, so I've been looking for other contractual work to pay off um, my debt and to allow me to survive while I take this on. Um, commitment, long hours and long nights. Uh, you basically work 24 hours and if you're trying to work across multiple time zones, you literally do get phone calls at 2 in the morning um, that you do have to take. Um, you just need to have the nerve. Um, it took me a long time to decide to do this. Um, and like both me and my partner Mona are very happy that we have. Um, but uh, if and when you do decide to, to start your own enterprise, um, you, need to, to, you need to just take a leap of faith. Um, get a second job. It's not going to pay the bills for a long time unless you get a really good investor. And then be prepared to fail and walk away. So um, there's the potential that you've identified an opportunity. And there's also the possibility that the solution you've defined is not the right one for that opportunity, right? To, to somehow um, take advantage or bring value kind of to that, that externality that we discussed. So that's, I think that's it for me. Um, next steps, we're trying to get feedback on our samples. We're working on marketing our products, uh, building a better website. So we were able to get uh, a very kind of low cost website up for in time for Christmas using Big Cartel. Um, and so if anybody's ever looking to put up a, an online shop, um, it's really easy and takes basically an hour and 20 bucks. Um, and then uh, we're trying to establish agreements with small factories. Um, to allow uh, the designers that we're working with to have their products produced. And that's it. Thank you, Mary. Our next speaker uh, is Ahmad Katish. Uh, he is the founder of K & Co. this topic from a different angle. So rather than the inspirational angle, um, I'm the founder of Kenko, and what we end up doing is we end up trying to work with companies, organizations, and, and social enterprises to try to help them figure out how to make it work. Um, and so the reality is, and, and from my experience, and this has sort of been replicated in studies and researches throughout the world, whether it's in the UK or, or the States or Canada, is that 50% of social enterprises will fail before they hit five. Um, and I'd like to start with the big insight first, uh, because A, uh, I want it to be real, and, and I want it to, uh, and, and I guess from my experience it's important, and, and whether it's like big non-for-profits I've worked for, or small social enterprises, it's good to keep this in mind so you can stay focused on what it is that you want to do. So what I want to do is I want to sort of work backwards from this statement and tell you from our experiences why this is the case and then I want to sort of walk you slowly through our model at k &Co to figure out why we sort of looked at this and sort of try to break it down so that we could work with people like you guys all the time. Um, the reasons that I've found in terms of why this statement is true is broken down into four. The first one is that philanthropy is hard to sell. Um, and that's the reality. Uh, depending on, on it, it's, it's difficult because, and I'll explain sort of why later, but, but, but that is true. And so like when you start social enterprise, and it is that fine balance of sort of having a profit venture and, and sort of having that social cost. It's really important that you understand that philanthropy is 
really hard to sell. Um, the second reason is low risk behavior, and that's sort of what you were speaking. Uh, um, because of resources and because of capacity, and, and, and don't see these as sort of the negatives. These are sort of like, I guess, the realities, if we look at them as the obstacles. Um, we can't take low risks um, because we're either working a second job or the investors that have put in the time and money into us need a much more detailed output. Um, and, and that sort of leads us to that third point of the short term versus long term goals. Um, if you're a not for profit and uh, you want to start a social enterprise and you get funded, um, you are funded in a particular model in such a way that they force you to just produce very quick short term goals, short term goals, short term goals. But if you look at it sort of at the other side and you look at sort of regular businesses, businesses sort of invest themselves in that long term goal strategies and these short term goals that will sort of help them reach what it is that they want to reach. And so that obviously provides a challenge. And the fourth one is what we call it in code, .tf. Um, and that's a don't ask, don't tell failure syndrome. Um, and, and, and then I'll explain sort of why, why that is important um, to look at rather than a crux as sort of an opportunity for us to learn. So like I was telling you, um, because philanthropy is hard to sell and because resources are tight, um, and, that, and they're tight not just for social enterprises, even for entrepreneurs, even for corporate, like even for investors. Even if you're a tech startup and you've got a lot of angel funding money and you're on a $20 million budget, it's still really tough to sell philanthropy. And, 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 and it is, and, and so what, I, what we found that people end up doing is they end up sort of employing a one-size-fits-all. So you're yeah, sort of employing, like, you know, we got to have a Twitter account, we have to have a Facebook group, we have to have um, an affordable online store, we have to have the mission statement, the mandate, so on and so forth. Um, but, in, but in business, it doesn't work this way. Um, and, and, and that's a reality. But because it is hard to sell, we sort of like fall back into, like, okay, this is what we're comfortable with, this is what we've seen other people do, and we move forward with it. Um, Money management and acquisition, like I was telling you, makes it even that much more harder to, to take a risk. And, 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 when, and, and when you limit yourself in terms of the risks that you take, it also makes it really hard to innovate. Whether it's from a service line, whether it's from a product line, whether it's organizational, whether whatever the case is. If you're operating at this very sort of narrow focus, you have to make sure that everything that you do is very calculated, is, it, it, it's sort of set up in a way that will allow you to, to continue doing what you're doing. Um, the short term versus long term. Um, it's, it's more common from my experience in working, sort of providing design and research and, and strategy services. It's, it's more common than it should be in social enterprises. Um, and, 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 and it is unfortunate. Um, with all sort of the stuff that, that exists, like that I spoke about earlier, it, it, it still is more than, than, than I'd like it to see, um, just for the case of success. Um, and, and it is, money acquisition is a very tough part. And, and, and you know, like the funding strategy is way more difficult than sort of any investor relation money that you get. And, and that is a given, for sure. So. And, I've, and what we've found, and, and, and the people sort of that work at Kanko is that we've, we, we, we see it more and more with not-for-profits and social enterprises. And that's this, and that's the difficulty in seeing the benefits of failure when you are working for social and environmental stage. And so if you go back to the first slide, 50% like won't make it to see their fifth year birthday. Um, all the time, all the money, all the investment that you've put towards it, if it doesn't work, it's kind of hard to sort of sit back and be like, okay, what do we need to do to figure out what to make it work? What's starting to happen, Social Edge, um, which sort of works with social enterprises, it's an organization out of the UK, is they've created failure case studies. And so they actually create like mini conferences where they invite people who started social enterprises that failed to come in and, and talk, which is, which is a genius idea. Um, it's a genius idea on many fronts. Um, you learn from your peers, you learn from different kinds of way. So what I wanted to sort of give you a little bit is to sort of, sort of tell you how Kane Co's model works 
Um, not the, so that you can adopt it, but just so that you could look at, when you're starting that social enterprise, the importance of establishing that emotional attachment to whomever comes in contact with whatever your brand is. Emotion sells. And I tend to find that most of our clients that are social enterprises or non-for-profit concentrate too much on the academic side of what it is that they are doing and, and, and sort of you know providing long lists of reports and, and so on and so forth of, of why you should think this particular way. Um, and you see it across, you even see it in politics. Uh, our recent election of, uh, of Ralph Ford as mayor is a perfect example of this. Um, our company branded the Joe Pantaloni campaign. And I can't tell you how hard it was to go back and forth with the campaign manager to tell them to not dumb down their ideas, but make their ideas more palatable for the public. And, and, and they wouldn't. They're like, well, we need to give them reasons why we're doing this way and why we're doing that way. And now we have a mayor who won on a platform that includes a gravy train and respect for the taxpayer. But that's how it works. That's the reality. That's the emotional energy that that particular. And, and so when you are starting that social enterprise, it's really important to keep that in mind because philanthropy is hard to sell most of the time. So what we do at K&Co in terms of how experience design works is that we pull away from the superficial stuff. So we pull away from like the three panel brochure, we pull away from um, the product package, and we pull away from all that kind of stuff. And we look at your experiences, or what we refer to as touch points. Because those are what's important to us. And what a touch point is, is every single time your brand comes in contact with a human being, regardless of whether or not that human being is your client, your customer, or somebody else that comes across. So then what we end up doing is we sort of, so, so like an, an example of like what your cool brand would be, um, we look at the different touch points and I sort of put up some stuff like in terms of like services, websites, blogs, presentations, staff, staff, these types of conferences, whatever the case is. And then what we end up doing is we end up using research and design, mostly contemporary research, to sort of figure out how we can maximize the positive connection or the emotional attachment of your brand at these touch points over a certain amount of time. And it's important to keep that time element focused because you don't wanna, you wanna move away from that one size fits all solution. So you don't want to have sort of a campaign that you wanna roll out for a year, for two years, because it won't be relevant and it won't matter. You'll be actually putting a lot more resources and time than you, than you need to do. So some of the research that it, that we use and what would be beneficial for you to research for your own um, benefit would be sort of cognitive psychology, human behavior analysis, usability studies, cultural analysis, neuropsychology, and ethnography. And then, and, and then we use that and then we combine it with sort of like these different design elements. So whether it be product design, advertising, marketing, social media, whatever. The point is, is that, that I'm trying to show is Working the other way around, or working in a model that is similar to this, allows you to pinpoint what works and what doesn't work in that social enterprise, and allows you to actually have like metrics, develop deeper insights to end, to ultimately to ultimately create that emotional bond that that, that you're after. Um, we are seeing sort of like a small change from like sort of like not for profits that we started working with at the beginning and we sort of see them transform into looking at that. Um, but like a perfect example, and, and I'll end on this example, is that we um, we work with, one of our clients is the Ontario Nonprofit uh, Network. And uh, at the beginning, it was a simple sort of contract that they, they wanted their website to be redesigned. But it was, again, that superficial solution that one size fits all, that, all, all the other elements. When we started looking at it from touch points and looking at it in terms of like, those four obstacles that, that I outlined at the beginning and working backwards from it, we ended up restructuring what their strategy is to get to a better goal of the website. And sometimes that may be the case. Resources are, I guess the last thing like, I'd, I'd, I'd close with because I'm, I'm really getting there. Sorry, Chad. If you're gonna start dimming the lights and that video's gonna come back on. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, Time is your, is your most important resource. Um, money helps a lot, because money stops you from getting that second, third, fourth job that we've all gone through it to get. But time is your most important resource. So when you're, when you're starting your social enterprise, my advice would be from seeing so many social enterprises, because 
look at time as your most important asset and figure out what you need to do to sort of maximize your return on investment, even if it's just time. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ahmed. Uh, next, we have Asef Wise, who's the Executive Director of uh, Youth Social Entrepreneurs of Canada. So, uh, that's always been a dream of mine to have that as an intro. So, awesome. <laughs> um, so my name is Asaf. Uh, I am one of the co-founders of the Young Social Entrepreneurs of Canada. Um, we are a, a two-year-old social enterprise that is now the nation's largest network of social entrepreneurs 18 to 34 years old. Um, and I just started dipping my feet into uh, another venture called Venture Delhi. Um, and there'll be more about that uh, a little bit later. Um, but first of all, I just wanted to get a sense from, from the people in this room. Uh, put up your hand if you've ever run, and keep it up, if you've ever run an enterprise, a social enterprise, an organization of any sort. Okay, awesome. So keep it up. And put it down if it has not been stressful. You're lying. <laughs> uh, and put it down as well uh, if it went according to plan. Okay, so you can put your hands in. Um, so that's just the nature of the game. Uh, I, I, I'm supposed to talk to you about starting a social enterprise, and, and the truth is it's a crapshoot. Um, just like starting any organization, there's lots of stuff that you won't know. Um, you're, that's why I, I, I don't get too invested in writing business plans and writing work plans because by the time I'm done writing them, they're pretty much irrelevant. Um, so I wanted to uh, share some of what I've learned running a social enterprise over the last year and a half. And at that social enterprise, I had uh, the privilege of seeing the guts and the insides of uh, dozens of other social enterprises run by youth across the country and got a sense of what was working and what wasn't as common trends um, uh, amongst all of them. So is it? Oh, amazing. Okay. So uh, my goal today is to give you a little bit of insight into how to survive social enterprise. Um, so I'm glad I didn't just jump to play. Um, if, if for those of you who have started and have gone and, and have, as, as Mary said, you know, uh, taken the leap and, and become risk ready. Um, then you know that uh, social enterprise and, and entrepreneurship in general is full of twists and turns and ups and downs, and it's, it's really tough to keep your head about you, which is one of the reasons why plans don't last for very long. Um, now, I'm not the first person to use this video as an example, but it's an open source world, so I will. Um, and this is the best illustration that I've ever seen about what entrepreneurship is like. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Here's the story again. Okay. According to ESPN, the baseball team, the Los Angeles Dodgers, played the San Francisco Giants in their 2009 home opening game. Okay. In the game, Dodgers second baseman Orlando Hudson hit for the cycle. That means Hudson hit a home run, a triple, a double, and a single all in one game. Right. The final score of the game was Dodgers 11, the Giants won. Okay. Go louder, go louder, Mike. How many runs did the Dodgers score in the game? 19. Oh, we're done. Are we done? <laughs> 
<laughs> so, uh, that's not far from the truth. Um, I, I, I've been a pretty stress-free person all my life. I started a social enterprise. Um, it ran into some problems, as all endeavors do. And I found myself, at the age of 25, starting to get headaches from stress. <coughs> Um, starting to get certain like ticks, like I would have to do things with my hands just just out of impulse. Um, it was all stress induced, okay. But it gets better. And that, that's not what it is. so. Um, this is what life is like during social entrepreneurship. And, and it's really stressful. And, and so what you do is you end up going and talking to people whose, whose advice you value. They might know about business. They might have started something themselves. They might just be a confidant for you. And they'll tell you all sorts of advice. And it's good advice, and you'll ignore most of it. Um, and you'll make the mistakes that they literally told you not to make. I know this because I did it. Um, so I want to talk to you today about three mistakes that I made, and three pieces of advice that I should have heeded from the start, and hopefully they'll stay with you. So it was when my ride came to an end after about a year and a half that, uh, that I realized that social entrepreneurship is actually a lot like puberty, okay? In that, I mean, think about it, it's, it's, it's weird. It's, uh, it, you, you have all this restless and creative energy, um, you want to collaborate with uh, social enterprises of the opposite cause, um, or of the same cause, it doesn't really matter. Right? Um, people are always asking you what you'll do when you're mature, and, uh, and, it's, and it's awkward and it creates an identity crisis. Every social enterprise goes through an identity crisis of, are we a non-profit or are we a for-profit? Where is the line in between? There is an internal tension that you'll have to navigate and that your team uh, will have to decide where their comfort zone is. Um, we uh, started out very much uh, on the social impact side because, no, no surprise, that's what compelled us to start what we did. And so after three months, uh, uh, three months after our launch, we looked back at what we had done and we said, um, you know, we we're happy with the social impact that we've had. We've gotten hundreds of people out to our events. Um, we feel good. The problem is that social enterprise is about what you measure. You measure what you care about. <coughs> And so we were, uh, we were really keen on the, the social metrics, but not paying attention at all to the financial metrics. So uh, it, was, it was actually at an advisor's meeting where we had all of our advisors who were experienced business advisors, and uh, we told them uh, how proud we were of ourselves for, for you know, running successful events, and they skewered us. Uh, they said, where is your financial data? Like, what is your financial position? So we got together the next week, and we had a meeting that reviewed our financial position, uh, and, and we figured out we were actually screwed. Uh, at the rate that we were burning cash, we had about three months left as an enterprise. So uh, we had generated about $3,000 in that time, which was a drop in the bucket compared to our needs, uh, and we were coasting off of grant funds. And one thing I would caution you, and, and this is just an aside, is that um, grant funds, can be addictive death for social enterprises. Um, if you model yourself as a nonprofit from the start, it's very, very hard to break from that cycle. Because it's just so easy to just apply for the next grant. But ultimately, it's limited. Um, so uh, we, we found that we were uh, in trouble. And this taught me uh, my second lesson about social enterprises. The first one was about identity crisis. The second one was that Money doesn't care about your social mission, okay? It's not that it's evil, it's that it's inanimate. It just doesn't care. Um, it doesn't have the capacity to. And as a social enterprise, you need to really emphasize the enterprise part. Toronto Enterprise Fund, uh, which, which funds um, uh, social enterprises for the last 10 years, put out a, a booklet of the lessons that they've learned. One of their key findings was that one of the biggest points of, of failure were social enterprises that did not take the enterprise part seriously. So you are starting a business. If you expect to have any type of hybrid income or fully for profit, you are starting a business and you need to be aware uh, of that and come to terms with that right away. 
And our mistake was that we didn't have a business model from the start, and you need one. Um, so what did we do? We said, oh crap, now we need to sell stuff, right? So uh, we, we looked at our organization and all the skills that we had on board, and we said, um, let's brainstorm every service that we could possibly provide and, and churn them out to, to uh, our client base as fast as we could. And in a week, we basically debuted 11 services. Everything from uh, networking events to uh, consulting referrals to uh, uh, business workshops to um, everything that we could get our hands on. And basically, people didn't know what the hell they were looking at when they looked at our organization. The problem that we had made, the, the, the mistake that we had made again was that we weren't focused. Um, we just were trying to grab cash as fast as we could because we were in survival mode. And that means that we didn't know how to allocate our resources uh, towards one of the services. And the other thing is, uh, as a social enterprise, you're going to have a customer base. And that customer base needs to know you for something. And they can't know you for many things. They can only really know you for one thing at a time. Maybe when you get up to be like a, a Deloitte or something, right, you can have multiple services. But for a startup, it's absolutely critical that you focus. Just pick one thing and do it really, really, really well. Later on, when you grow, you'll be able to add all sorts of other bells and whistles. <coughs> Pick one thing that is your defining service. It's uh, definitely the, the third piece of, of, of advice that I, would, uh, that I would give you. Um, so just to sum up really, really quickly, uh, determine your identity from day one and measure what you care about. Uh, you need a business model from day zero and focus on one thing. It takes an incredible amount of discipline to do that, um, but it's really important. And the way that you know that you're focused is if you can tell someone what you do in 10 words or less. Okay. And the last thing uh, is, I, uh, so I, w I was a bit late driving here. I was driving uh, on, the, on the highway and uh, you know, the roads are terrible outside, and there was uh, all kinds of tow trucks out, and there was some accidents to the side. Someone nearly hit my car. Um, and I said, this is crazy. Why am I still driving on a road? Why are we still driving uh, uh, car by car? And when one car stops, the entire road slows down. And what happens there is that you have hundreds or thousands of cars just sitting there emitting carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide into the air, right? And it's just a complete point of inefficiency in our society. And it got me really frustrated. One, because I was in traffic. Um, but two, because it's an unnecessary thing. And what I, what I want to uh, point to you guys is that there are lots of people with good intentions in the world, but not a lot of them have the requisite skills to take what they want into the market. You as engineers and related fields, I, I assume, um, have a an incredible asset in your skill base. And I was telling a friend of mine the other day that I think that engineers are gonna take over the work. Um, because, yeah, there you go. Um, you, you have an incredible asset that you really need to use. Um, and the last thing that I wanna leave you with is don't do the safe Canadian thing. You know, aim for the middle, start a small business and be happy with, with you know, five employees and so on. You'll have to start small, there's no question about it. But the route to success for social enterprise is by starting the next Google, the next Groupon. We have to start thinking like that. Uh, Canadians have to start thinking about themselves as world-class talent and starting to behave like that. And uh, um, you said that 50% uh, of social enterprises fail in the first five years. I was, I was like, wow, I'm, I'm really excited that 50% survive. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there is an enormous amount of opportunity. We've never been at a time in the world where so many major uh, uh, systems are being reorganized at once, and that creates an enormous amount of opportunity. You could say it's a shame that uh, 2 billion people live on less than $8 a day, uh, but the fact is that their, their combined purchasing power is something like four trillion in the, in the next couple of years. So you can't tell me that there isn't an opportunity to serve those people. So, 
if you start, well, first of all, I think you should start. I think starting a social enterprise is the most important thing that you can do for Canada and for the world because it's about actually taking solutions, bringing them to fruition in a sustainable way. Uh, and if you do that, go big from the start because even if you fail, at least you fail big. Um, and, and I think that's the most important thing that you can do, so thank you. Uh, uh, our next speaker, uh, Tony Hancock, is the co-founder and president of operations for Ethical Ocean, and I'll bet you know what's happening now. three jobs that I've had in my life and the things that they've taught me so far. I'm still a young whippersnapper, so there's some things I'm going to learn still, but um, I have learned some things. So in 2007, I was lucky enough to work with Engineers Without Borders in Malawi. Um, I was working with smallholder tobacco farmers, and we can talk about it after why that's actually a good thing. And basically, we were trying to reduce the amount of wood that tobacco farmers are using when they're actually curing their tobacco. So I remember getting to my placement and seeing this technology that the German government had designed. They are so good at designing it. And I grabbed the plans to go meet with my first farmer in the field. I put them under my arm. I had a beautiful skip to my step. It was a wonderful day. So I handed them the plans, which looked actually more complicated than this, but this was about what they looked like. And he looked at them, and he was looking at me kind of over the paper, a little questioningly. He turned it 90 degrees, and then he turned it 90 degrees again. He looked up at me, really kind of shaking his head, and he said, Hey, Tony, we are not together on this. <laughs> we had not taken into account at all how farmers learn how they build their existing barns, and how they were going to accept this type of information. Which brings me to my first lesson. Technology alone will not save us. With all the problems that the world is facing today, I really believe that engineers are going to be a critical part in coming up with solutions. But the number of people I've met that focus only on the technology, that focus only on the nuts and bolts of what the solution is going to be, and who are completely blind to human factors is astounding. And I think we've got to get better at recognizing that it has to go hand in hand, those human factors, for these technologies to actually work. This is my first part-time job. Um, I wear one of those horrible red uniforms. Uh, and I was working in the tribe of metropolis of Cochrane, Alberta. The guy that owned this store was an RCMP officer, and um, he had saved up enough money to purchase this franchise. He cared about one thing, and that was my mom. All he wanted to know about was how it affected his bottom line. I was 16, I didn't know what bottom line was, but I knew that he got really mad if I did anything that wasted it. I want to do a quick little poll here. Um, who thinks that Nestle is a sustainable company? Okay. Yeah, don't be shy. I really want to get a feel for this. What about Cadbury? Okay. Walmart? Okay. Canadian Tire? Yeah, I didn't consider that. Um, I had the opportunity to hear a keynote from uh, their chief sustainability officer two months ago. I, I can't believe Canadian Tire has a chief sustainability officer. I would expect that from Mac. 
and we do have one, but not from Canadian Tire. And his presentation was so boring and so impossible to follow, but his message was very clear, and I actually did remember it. He said that sustainability is no longer a differentiating factor in your business. They plan for every ton of carbon that's emitted in their operations, that it's going to cost them $30. So in decisions they're making today, they're assuming that they're going to have to pay for that carbon in 10 years. And so that's impacting the decisions they're doing now and making them a more sustainable company. And it's not because they care about the environment. He said flat out, we actually don't. It's because it drives to their bottom line. So lesson number two that I've learned recently is that the social part of your business is actually no longer a differentiating factor. You have to have a business, an idea that stands on its, on its own, and definitely the social part of it is something wonderful and it's a great story to tell, and it's you know, something that, that, that does set you apart when you look back at what you've done. But it's gotta be a business that works on its own. You can't rely on that. Everybody's gonna start doing this. Finally, at the Ocean, for those that didn't put up their hand, I'll give a brief overview. Uh, we're an e-commerce site, we sell eco-friendly, fair trade, organic products, and we try and offer something for everybody that is more ethical than what they currently are using in their home. We've had, we launched eight months ago, we've had some decent successes since then. Um, 2,500 products now on our site, we have 200 different sellers across Canada and the US that are selling on our site. Um, we've had over 35,000 people visit. That's peanuts compared to eBay or Amazon, but you know, we're actually seeing real growth there. And we've had thousands of ethical products sold that would have not been sold otherwise. Um, I'm now comfortable in saying that we are the largest online ethical retailer in Canada, and we are definitely looking south of the border. Now, there's been a lot of things that I've learned kind of in my involvement. Eight months ago, I also quit my full-time engineering job to take this on full-time. So point 2.5, I guess, two and a half, is that you have to be willing to take some risk in order to, to see what you want to, to be done actually happen. But the biggest thing for me is <clears throat> the people that I work with, we get up every Sunday morning and we work on this thing for five, seven, 10, sometimes 16 hours on Sundays. People are working other jobs other than myself and are able to still find time for 20, 30 hours a week to put into this when they're already stressed to the max and they're already, you know, have so many balls in the air. And we can't even explain to people how this model works. We have all sorts of, you know, advisors from incubators and potential investors that are giving us advice. And we tell them, yeah, we're seven people that are, are building this company on a part-time basis. And they look at us like we're crazy. How do you know that they're gonna be there tomorrow? How do you know that people are not gonna put their job first? Well, we're now two years after when we first got together, and we're still volunteering 30 hours a week. In fact, it's probably gonna be 35 hours a week next month, you know? It just keeps getting more and more committed, and we keep seeing more out of these people. So lesson number three for me, there's somebody missing from this picture I should mention. I tried the Photoshop, but it didn't work very well. Your team is absolutely everything. You have to be able to get along with these people. Day in and day out, you need to know they have your back and you need to inspire each other. The day we sent out our email to first tell people that this site even existed in February, we all slept over, we got up at seven in the morning, Blared some African music, had some waffles, and sent it all together before we all went to work. That's the kind of people that you need on either side of you if you're going to make something like this work. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you, Tony. I'm going to ask um, all of our speakers to quickly come to the front. Um, oh, so that's Tony, Mary, Ahmed, Asaf. Um, we only have about six minutes for questions. So I'm going to do only four questions. I want a question for each speaker. Um, so who's uh, interested in asking something first? Yeah. 
Mr. Emsworth? I had a question for Tony on that last point. If the team is all that is like what really matters, just like what's your strategy to like get that team to be so strong? Or uh, suggestions? How did we attract those people in the first place? How did we come together as a or, team? Or keep it. Or just like what's your strategy? Uh, well, I think we, we work together and we play together. That's that's step one. I mean, we'll be working on a business plan until 2 a.m. and then the next day we'll be tobogganing um, together. So that's really important. And we, we actually just went with people that we already had strong ties with. Five out of the seven of us are EW peers. Um, you know, we've worked in Africa together, we've worked at the national office together. It's people that we already knew and had a lot of social capital with. Um, that doesn't mean you can't get that with somebody new, but you definitely save a lot of process in order to start with that. Thanks. What do you sit down? <laughs> You're free left. Question? This is a question for Asaf. Um, you, you made a, a point of emphasizing the whole thing. Um, I'm just curious, um, do you have any specific examples as to a social enterprise that has gone big and succeeded? And why, you, why do you say go big like that? I've never seen a, a social enterprise go very big. I don't so I actually think that's part of the problem. Um, <coughs> I don't have a lot of examples. That's one of the reasons why I'm so emphatic about it. I mean, uh, depending on what your view of Grammy is, you could look at Grammy Bank and say that they've gone big. Um, and when you show that there is uh, a lucrative opportunity, uh, you can create a, a, an industry out of what you're doing. Um, I, I hope to go big with mine. I, I, I don't really, I, I can't point off the top of my head, maybe some of you can. I can speak to, uh, uh, to, to the social enterprise that has gotten really, really big. Well, Dossier. Well, Dossier. So they're um, the largest supplier of, of uh, organic uh, health and beauty products and uh, in terms of like um, uh, other products like like you know like G diapers and so on and so forth. So they're a perfect example of you know to what Sal was saying, like you know, a social enterprise that really went big. So uh, just to just to finish up, I, I think uh, one of the things that, that really compels me about that point is what I've seen around the world, where people really believe that they are world class, that their enterprise is world class, whereas we in Canada tend to think that, like, okay, maybe, you know, I'll do it, and, and advisors tell you to slow down and think, about, like, it, it's silly. Uh, Canada has world class talent, and it should be acting like that, and that's one of the reasons why I say we should have world class social enterprise. We have two left. Uh, this one's for Mary. Um, so Mary, with uh, social enterprise, uh, such as the one that, that you're involved in, uh, it, it's fairly complex. You have people on one side of, of the world creating these products and people possibly you know, north or west sort of buying these things. And I can see it being difficult to get going and getting that momentum and getting that sell and getting traction. And I wonder what your strategy is for sort of getting something to the point where it's it's sellable and you can get people on board in both places. Right, I, I, so it's a challenge. Um, in terms of strategizing, um, we don't try to strategize too much. We just don't have the time to do it. Um, I think the basic rule that we use is will we ever buy this ourselves and when our friends buy this? So it's really about, um, I would say, like trend forecasting, trying to understand that. So trying to understand like the normal retail model. And then um, really trying to get like
how do you make sure that what you're doing is really actually serving the progress of the community? Well, um, being, being a designer, I'm very biased to a sort of a lot of the practices that I've designed. Um, and so design thinking isn't just about making things pretty or you know, finding out what psycholo psychology research is. Out of it that it's about you know it's what Tony was talking about in terms of that first plan that was given to us at that point. Um, design thinking looks at that, looks at sort of um, um, will this work? How, how are their systems set up? It looks at it more from the systems point of view as opposed to the situation. So what I would recommend is to actually have all these checks throughout the process. So you can uh, almost always get constant feedback. Um, so that this way, you're not sort of like all the way at the end and having to sort of change course and do these things differently. If you have metrics that you can measure, in terms of the four months that I pointed up there, it allows you to be like, okay, this is working because of this, this isn't working because of this. That would be my idea. Okay, so thank you. Um, I count of you, 66 of us in the room. Um, I've had a chance over the last two years to get to know quite a few social entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, founders. Um, and the one characteristic that I'm seeing kind of within them all is optimism. So there are 66 people here. If you uh, grouped up in groups of four or five, we could have 10 new social enterprise, social enterprises launched by the end of the day. Um, <laughs> and that's really what I want you to take from this. We've been able to pull out lessons from very different social enterprises, different models, uh, different structures, different size teams, uh, but they've all said, you know, I want to do something and they've done it. Um, we can applaud them, they've shared insights, it's been a fun session and thank you all for coming and feel free to take the time.